and is going to give a talk, as we can see up there, on um, you know neuromodulation and uh, TMS. So without further ado, um, I'll hand it over to Dr. Agarwal. Thank you, Reagan. Hi, um, thank you for coming. Today I'm going to be talking to you about um, part three in the series of uh, neuromodulation talks that I've given. Um, and today we're going to be talking about transcranial direct current stimulation and some related technologies. I have no disclosures um, for you all, um, but I do have a disclaimer. Um, and the disclaimer is that some of these uh, technologies are investigational and some of them are not FDA approved. Some of them are FDA approved. So. Um, also, the, the work that I'm going to be presenting is not mine. It's actually borrowed, probably borrowed pretty heavily. Um, so I'm very thankful for that. Um, this was on the cover of Wired um, about two years ago. Um, so um, my first talk um, several years ago was on deep brain stimulation. And then um, I also gave a talk on transcranial magnetic stimulation. Um, and then after that, um, I talked a little bit about um, glutamine, I'm sorry, glutamate and, um, and dopamine and how um, this has paved the way to help understand how uh, antidepressants and other mood stabilizers might work. And some of this information is going to integrate um, in what and how we understand TDCS. And what the common link may be um, is the default mode network um, system. So the concept we'll discuss um, Slight burning sensation. I guess probably similar to a less intense version of sticking a nine volt battery in your tongue. I think I was just looking at alternative therapies. The medications had so many side effects, and I was looking into various methods of treatment. We can achieve the same thing without a chemical or without a drug, but you know, much faster just by stringing information from a smartphone to a device you run your head. Yeah. Curious as to what it would be like to change aspects of my own brain for very short periods of time. Don't try this at home. <laughs> My mother was diagnosed with bipolar disorder and uh, I lost my aunt to major depression. So that was, um, that was suicide. And then myself, diagnosed with bipolar at age 19 after being diagnosed with major depression from age 15. Very nice. Very nice. It's a roller coaster ride. So emotionally, um, pre therapy and, and medication. I was either starting a thousand projects or drinking a lot or unable to leave the bed some days. A couple of suicidal ideations as well, so um, emergency department trips and uh, yeah, it has been quite debilitating in my life. You have to be strong-minded to be able to live with somebody that does suffer with depression in such a big way. It's been hard. It's not been an easy road for myself as well. But I don't think that that is anything near what they go through themselves. I've been through the gamut of antidepressants and mood stabilizers, and I decided to try transcranial direct current stimulation as another method. All ready to go? So I'm just going to start by measuring your head. That's great. Just put your... So that's an example of how debilitating um, certain um, disorders are in psychiatry. And um, that patient um, was intractable to his medications because, partly also because of the side effects. Um, Transcranial direct um, current stimulation is not new. Um, it's uh, a technique that's been around since um, at least the 1800s. And this is a picture of um, Aldani, Gio Giovanni Aldani, an Italian um, professor of phys physics who was the first to employ um, using um, voltage stimulation to the head for treating melancholy. 
and you can see here he's got um, he's stimulating um, this person here, and uh, he was successfully able to treat melancholy in around 1801. Um, he took his device to England, and um, in a demonstration, he provided uh, stimulation to a cadaver. Um, he actually stimulated perianally and also on the head. Um, the effect was to cause um, contractions, muscular contractions in the cadaver, um, such that the cadaver uh, lifted, and this caused mass hysteria. And they say that this might be the, um, the uh, source for the uh, fictional tale of Fra Frankenstein. Um, so this kind of put a setback on the application of um, electrical stimulation technologies. However, uh, neurophysiologists have been working um, very consistently in this, in, in this field. Um, so far, there's several different neurostimulation technologies. Um, there's only a few that are FDA approved. Um, TDCS is not FDA approved, um, but um, ECT, DBS, and RTMS are approved. Um, neuromodulation is the physiological process of influencing uh, cortical neurons um, by inducing neural plasticity, and it's basically referring to an emerging class of medical therapies. Um, the way it works is it can, it can involve pharmacological changes or electrical stimulation or both. Um, the disadvantages of medications is that they cause widespread um, side effects, and these effects could affect the liver through P450 enzymes. There could be cardiac toxicity, renal toxicity. Um, metabolic syndrome, um, and furthermore, um, like EPS. But the other thing about um, medications is that they don't offer targeted um, selective uh, treatment, and um, it might take a little while. However, the advantages are they're relatively cheap, and there's been a long track record of proven efficacy. Um, antidepressants, um, when reviewed through meta-analysis, um, shows approximately a 52% crude aggregate um, response rate um, and a remission rate about 38%. Um, so a neurostimulation um, offers an opportunity to actually provide targeted selective therapy um, while um, avoiding unwanted widespread side effects of medications. Um, if we look at the uh, cortex, a slice of the cortex, um, we can um, see that um, through neurostimulation um, we can cause intrinsic subthreshold oscillations to occur which modulate um, cortical neurons. And um, this actually has an effect on um, neural plasticity. There's basically two types of neurostimulation. And the first involves basically direct currents and the other is indirect currents. Um, the most common one that everyone might be familiar with is electroconvulsive therapy. Um, TECS is similar to um, ECT in that there's a direct application of um, the electrodes. However, TDCS does not require having general anesthesia um, or an EKG monitor, um, blood pressure cuff, or um, a nursing staff um, in a um, recovery unit. Um, the other technology that's um, been employed is RTMS, and that involves um, inductive currents, and it doesn't require anesthesia. Um, so basically, RTMS um, involves higher voltages, and um, TECS also um, is similar, but it doesn't require as much voltage as ECT, um, and its um, efficacy is related to synaptic sensitivity. There's another treatment um, that, that's been widely used and it involves using a TENS unit. And here's an example of a TENS unit. Um, this is basically a TDCS device. So um, would anyone like to volunteer to be stimulated today? Well, I, I didn't think so. Um, so basically, you can buy one of these at the, at the local pharmacy. They cost anywhere from like $25 to about uh, 60 or 80. This was about $70. And basically what you do with this is um, you use them for treating localized pain. And they come with these uh, electrode pads. And you could actually go right now to the pharmacy and buy yourself a TDCS device. The difference, though, is that this device um, is pretty sophisticated. And um, uh, I'll, get, I'll show you exactly how it works in a little bit. So 
RTMS involves inductive currents, and these currents, um, what they do is they cause eddy, so they causes a, it involves a magnetic field which induces uh, um, eddy currents in the brain. Um, these affect cortical uh, networks um, which have deep um, effects within, um, the, the, within the limbic system. Similarly, when you apply a direct current um, using TDCS, you also create a, a, an electric field gradient. The, the difference, though, is that, as I'll show in a little bit, is that the brain has ions, cations and anions. So the anode attracts anions, uh, that's a positive charge. The cathode attracts cations. So you have a pull this way and a pull that way. Well, that's pretty interesting because it creates a unique um, technology for modulating uh, neuronal systems. Here's an example of a TCS device, and um, that's a head cap. And this is the same device with the back of it. That's the um, amplifier unit. And here's a more ergonomic um, system that was developed. This is particularly being developed for gaming. TDCS stands for Transcranial Direct Current Stimulation, and it involves putting two or more electrodes somewhere on the scalp, um, quite often on the forehead, but not necessarily on the forehead. They will be positioned in such a way that they will stimulate a, a particular part of the brain that um, either a researcher or an experiment, someone experimenting with it wants to activate. And what happens is that a small direct current uh, travels between the electrodes and excites the neurons, so makes them more likely to fire, to, to engage in whatever cognitive task is being carried out. So this is the, the main part of the device, and it's, it's made from plastic, basically, and involves uh, four electrodes here. Um, so it would sit on the head, sort of <laughs> like this. The market has just sort of emerged properly, so you can buy these devices now online, and currently, where they make no treatment claims, they're not regulated. The whole unit devices that are, have now emerged on the market are being marketed uh, predominantly for gamers. This could be because there's a particular interest in the gaming community, and I think that's probably quite likely. The claim is that it can increase uh, focus and reaction time so that you can game better and for longer. But it might also be partly to do with um, the limits of the claims that manufacturers can make if they want to avoid uh, their devices being regulated. So if they make claims um, about gaming that is very far removed from the sort of treatment claims that might be to do with um, helping stroke patients or people suffering with depression that the medical uh, community is investigating. The stimulation event is recommended and is set on the device to last for about 20 minutes uh, but the effects persist for up to about two hours afterwards um, as has been shown in, in clinical studies so um, I think the idea is that you just get a, a a sort of better gaming experience for longer and you can uh, beat all your competitors. TDCS so, stands for trans... So that sounds uh, pretty interesting. Wouldn't anyone want to have an advantage over their competitors? Um, so that's that particular device. And um, there's another device which I actually showed you. It's the TENS unit. These have been around for at least 30 years. Um, so basically um, what it involves, it is actually direct current, but um, you, by changing the settings on it, you can actually... Um, get something else that's um, similar. It's called, so you'll, you're going to hear about transcranial alternative, alternating current stimulation. Um, basically what that is, is it's providing a pulse um, of uh, electricity. So um, it can involve square waves or ramp waves. But basically, so, so you can take one of these, buy it from the drugstore, and slap it on your head, just as we're doing, um, as I'm going to show you. And you can actually feel what this feels like. But the advantage of this unit is it's actually got alternating current. So it's actually more sophisticated. But um, the research for um, TACS isn't as evolved as for TDCS. Um, and here's an example of that particular one unit that I just showed you. Um, so the advantages of neurostimulation through TDS is that it's, it's relatively low cost. I mean, we're talking about 30 bucks, you know. Um, these devices are portable. You can take them anywhere. Um, so if you're uh, treating, like, um, rehabilitation from stroke or aphasia, um, you can have it on the go. Um, furthermore, they're safe. Uh, there's no memory loss like there is in ECT, um, and you can drive home. And, and then furthermore, 
one of the really cool things is that's multimodal. There's a lot of different areas of the brain that you can target to get different effects. So when we treat depression um, using neurostimulation, we have to take advantage of one of the principal things about the brain is that um, depression is actually lateralized. It turns out that the left dorsal lateral prefrontal cortex uh, is inhibited. The activity of that is inhibited. And on the right, it's actually activated. So um, the treatment um, modality is to actually stimulate on the left side and inhibit on the right side. So that's um, depolarization on this side and hyperpolarization on that side. Well, it turns out that TDCS offers this unique um, property to be able to do both at the same time, which is a unique advantage over RTMS, which only does, say, um, one modality on one side at one time. So um, there's different target locations for targeting um, the particular therapy or um, condition that you want. So for depression, we often will choose the dorsal lateral prefrontal cortex. Um, and for a rehabilitation post-stroke, you can target the motor cortex. Um, this um, basic concept comes from um, what's known as resting state networks. Um, basically, what happens in certain conditions, such as alcoholism or PTSD or depression, um, it turns out that the cortical, um, cortical control is actually decreased. Um, and you get this bottom-up um, effect. So you get limbic activity actually overdriving that of the, the cortical um, uh, control. And that is also said um, to be responsible for um, in, involved in cravings and, and alcoholism and drug addiction. So um, this area, the prefrontal cortex, is suppressed. So if we were to stimulate this area, maybe we can actually potentiate um, cortical control. And that's basically the concept um, behind this. So in order to actually localize the target areas, they use the 1020 system, the EEG 1020 system. And it involves um, basically um, localizing um, C3 um, for the primary motor cortex and F3 and FP1 for the dorsal lateral uh, prefrontal cortex. And here's uh, M1, uh, Bodman's area 4, and the dorsal lateral prefrontal cortex, dorsal lateral 9 and 10. Um, there's a variety of different parameters that are used um, in setting up your device. The key thing is that it's low voltage. Um, and the current amplitude that they're using right now is about 2 milliamps. So you'll target your device to get about 2 milliamps. Um, this is the resistance between and through your head. Or, um, so we're not delivering a lot of current. Um, and I'll get into the field effects in a second. So some of the important parameters are not just the target, but um, there's the voltage and current amplitude. You can change the number of pads. So if you want to target different areas, you can um, add more pads, or you can attenuate um, the signal by, um, by the way you ground, um, ground, it, uh, ground your um, cathode. Um, and then there's combination therapy. The other thing that's an advantage of TDCS is it actually serves as pretreatment for TMS and actually potentiates the effect of TMS. So if you do TDCS before, you can actually get a stronger RTMS response. Um, here we can see the, um, the scalp, and we see that there's a, lot of these, there's a lot of tissue. And it turns out, if you were to actually model this, um, you, you could actually uh, view it kind of like a semiconductor. So um, we have a resistance right here. Uh, the skin is conductive. Um, the brain is conductive. It's, you could consider this as like a dielectric. Um, so there's, um, there's cations and anions. Um, and there's uh, gray matter white, um, and white matter. Um, so um, one can actually see um, this as kind of like a semiconductor. This is um, a semiconductor um, cross section of a transistor. And this is dielectric. So if you apply a charge at the gate, and a charge, so an anode here and a cathode here, you're going to drive current. Um, but you're going to have some resistance. So here's the, um, here's the cross-section of the motor, of the, of the, of the, of the cortical um, layers. And um, we, we have a network of neurons. Um, the deeper layers are actually involved in a lot of the processing that um, we engage in. But, so there's lots of fibers here. There's more um, gray matter in the layer, deeper layers. And there's these loops. So when you think about all the networks that are in the brain, those, those networks are basically creating these loops. 
And then if you consider that, if you extrapolate that, that's like an inductor, because you have all these loops of, of wires. So um, you can actually model this. So this is a, um, a representation of the uh, cortex, and this is like a, com a computerized model um, right here. So we can actually model this um, using some basic electrical um, um, principles. Um, here's like what happens when you have a magnetic field. The same thing would occur through um, a direct um, voltage field. Um, and so um, what happens is the field effects causes stimulation to the neurons, and this electricity is transmitted to the membranes. Um, this is the Hodgkin and Huxley model of modeling membranes as a capacitor and a, res a conductance. Um, and um, here's an example of the field effects on the soma. Um, when you increase the, the membrane potential, you'll, you can trigger an action potential, and this action potential will propagate. Well, it actually propagates generally this way. But, um, um, and then the important thing, though, is that we can model this as an RLC network. That's a resistor, inductor, and a capacitor. Frequency response, direct um, dielectric constant, that means it holds charge. And when you model this in, um, in electronics, you get um, oscillations. And that's what our brain does. It's, it's, it's involved in processing oscillations. Um, so if we look at how uh, TDCS works, um, we can see that um, basically there's this application of an anode and a cathode. So when the anode is applied at the top, it draws anions up and then um, and then at the, the cathode over here draws cations down, so it's negative charge here. So what the, they say, what the, the scientists um, believe is that it's this actual depolarization of the soma that's responsible for the effect um, that's seen in terms of affecting plasticity. Um, and if we were to measure um, the actual um, potential um, at layer five, um, we would actually measure about 0.3 volts um, or um, per meter, actually it turns out to be it's about 0.12 millivolts at the, at the soma. That's not very much if we consider that action potentials occur at around um, minus 20, is that right? No, plus, plus 20, I forget, oh my gosh. Um, so, I mean, if we're sitting at minus 70 and, um, yeah, we have to get to about plus 20, I think, to trigger an action potential. So that's not very much, um, uh, um, amplitude change. So what's going on here? Well, it turns out what um, TDCS is doing is it's modulating EPSPs, which are excitatory postsynaptic potentials, um, as can be seen here. Here is basically um, uh, a, a normal EPSP, but under TDCS, there's a, there's a larger amplitude. Well, these EPSPs summate to cause an action potential uh, to fire. Um, and under hyperpolarization, hyper um, the uh, amplitude diminishes. So this would be inhibitory postsynaptic potentials. Um, and the net effect is to actually increase the gain um, of the actual signal. So there's an increase in the amplitude of the gain. Um, and it turns out um, this um, was actually measured in 1964 um, in an animal. And what they found is that by injecting current um, on cortical neurons, um, there's this gradient of firing. So as you inject more and more current, um, the cells will fire at a certain rate. And if you step up, you get even more uh, firing. Um, so the amplitude increases. Actually, the number of spikes increases. Um, and then if you hyperpolarize, you can attenuate this response. Well, it turns out that I happened to work in a lab in, at McGill that actually reproduced this, but um, demonstrated it. So this is an intact brain specimen. This is an, an, an individual neuron. So this work um, was done um, by uh, um, Dr. Igorov and um, uh, Bassam Hamam, um, Eric Franson, Michael Hosselmo, who's at BU, and my advisor, um, Angel Alonzo. Um, they, they demonstrated that um, a single individual neuron, we're, talking, we're not talking about a network, we're talking a single neuron has the capacity to hold a memory representation. And this was a big finding because it demonstrated that Heb wasn't, Heb's idea of neuroplasticity wasn't entirely right. Um, so a single neuron can hold a memory. And so this is an example where 
as you inject current um, and you step up, you have an increase in firing. And if you, this lasts for minutes. So this is memory. This is uh, the soma of the cell holding a memory trace. And when you step down by hyperpolarization, hyper this um, firing rate decreases. So this is an important principle in terms of synaptic plasticity. Um, so where did this all come from? It came from Donald Hebb. Donald Hebb was a Canadian neurophysiologist who um, postulated that um, when neurons fire together, they wire together. And that's the basis for long-term potentiation and long-term depression. Well, um, my advisor, um, al along with one of my um, lab mates, um, showed that this doesn't just involve the dendrites. It also involves single, it can occur at a single neuron level and, and the soma. And, and as I said earlier, TDCS affects the soma of neurons. Um, and this ultimately results in changes in the functional connectivity of resting state networks. Um, so um, we know um, resting state networks are involved in, in the pathophysiology of psychiatric illness. Um, so default mode networks are important um, because it turns out um, that when neurons um, fire closely together, they're functionally connected. So, I mean, they're, they're firing in, in the same manner. So, um, um, that's the principle behind default um, networks where um, it's the resting state. It's what the basal state of the brain is. Um, so, it's like the meditative state. It's, it's, it's associated with introspection and, and it's associated with sleep, meditation, daydreaming. So, if you just look away, whatever you're thinking about, that's your resting state. Depressed patients tend to be thinking about negative things. Um, so that's their resting state. So the idea here is to modulate that. And um, so what neurostimulation, this is my hypothesis, uh, does is that it actually um, potentiates um, the uh, inputs that um, we receive um, by um, affecting um, the feedback from the default mode network. Um, so um, if Neurostimulation is combined with learning, and this is important as I'm going to have to demonstrate, uh, point out is that psychotherapy is really important um, for treating patients um, in psychiatry because it, it, it helps to um, change the default network um, by changing synaptic plasticity. And that's really the only way you can effectively help a patient. Um, here um, we see that TDCS actually induces um, functional connectivity, and this was measured in the motor cortex. Um, again, I, talked, I gave a talk about how dopamine and glutamate affect learning. Um, dopamine is the reward system. It's, it's actually amplifying whatever signal's coming in, whatever you experience in your environment. And then glutamate is the actual system that um, is involved in NMDA receptor regulation and, and actually the structural changes, the synaptic connections um, either um, if too much excited, to excited toxicity causes cell death and down regulation and too much excited, too, too little um, um, needs to be upregulated a little bit. Um, anyway, so um, we have field effects that can influence the excitability of neurons. Um, and we know that the cortex is involved in the control of emotions and, and um, we can, you know, modulate our levels of pain through CBT or through um, you know, consciousness. Um, and uh, there's also, like, humming, for instance, has been shown to actually minimize auditory hallucinations. So the work of Ron Duman at Yale demonstrated in the ketamine model that there's actually an increase in synaptic um, boutons after this antidepressant, if you want to call it that, or um, anesthetic is delivered. Um, so this perhaps is the actual mechanism for how medications are working. They're actually changing synaptic function and uh, efficacy. So here's the normal state of our synaptic um, tree. And here, um, under stress, you release glucocorticoids, and that causes a down regulation of synaptic boutons. Um, and BDNF levels actually decrease. However, if you provide antidepressants and also, neurostimulation, you upregulate, or you should be upregulating BDNF so that there's an upregulation of these synaptic connections. 
Um, we know that this, there has to be a common final pathway because neuroimaging studies show that the same areas of the brain um, respond. So um, this is um, the CJ, CG25 area. And um, when we um, provide SSRIs, we get a response to that area. There's also the placebo effect. Um, and then RTMS um, causes changes, ECT, DBS. Um, so we know that uh, different modalities can be used to treat um, target areas. And here's just a representation of all the many different ways in which um, connections can occur. So NMDA receptors are important because they're principally involved in synaptic plasticity. So Uxell and Onger, um, Onger is at Harvard now, I think he's at Bel in Belmont. Um, um, he, they demonstrated through brain imaging studies that um, glutamate abnormalities are related to patients with uh, mood disorders. And I talked a little bit about that in my last talk. Um, the most important thing, though, is to understand is that NMDA receptors are both voltage and ligand gated. And not a lot of people talk about this. And this is something, I guess, I don't know if it's because I'm an electrical engineer, but this is something that's really important. It's fundamentally unique because unlike other receptors in the brain, there's two ways in which we modulate these receptors, um, current or voltage, and then um, ligands, so glutamate and um, decycloserine, um, glycine. So you have to have two inputs in order for this receptor to actually um, release calcium. That's really important because calcium can trigger apoptosis and cell death. And so we have a very fine, very delicate system for affecting how we learn. Um, so this is very essential for synaptic plasticity. And here is basically um, a, a diagram showing you that complex web where you have amper receptors involved in um, causing voltage depolarization, which affects the NMDA receptor. And then you also have um, GLUR1, uh, and you have these um, co-ligands. Um, and there's downstream effects. This can be involved in long-term changes or short-term changes for extrasynaptic NMDA receptors, and then there's synaptic. Note that this is the bouton, and there's changes at the genetic level. This is a representation of an NMDA receptor. Again, there's co coagonist glycine. Um, and the, so, um, so what are some of the uses of TDCS? Well, they, are, they postulate that um, these are some of the uses, uh, ranging from cognitive tasks to um, meditate, meditation. Um, and um, over the past, uh, say, 10, 15 years, um, there's been an exponential rise in the amount of publications on TDCS. Um, of all those papers, um, this is just one random paper that I just decided to put up. And in this study, they looked at perceptual sensitivity um, to detecting complex threat. And you can understand that the military would probably want to be um, uh, get their hands on anything that can potentiate that. And it turns out um, the military does use TDCS to help train its drone pilots. Um, here's a study that was done by Clark and others at the University of Mex New Mexico in which they used uh, a video game. Um, and this is Brian Kaufman, and um, he's one of the researchers. But the idea is here is to detect the response time to find out where the threat in the environment is. And here there's supposed to be a gun right there. This is a shadow of a sniper rifle, and there's a bomb underneath there. So what they did is they measured um, the time for, it took for um, learning to occur um, in response to TDCS, and they showed that there was an actual increase in learning, and that this effect was actually dependent on the location and the current strength. So two milliamps had a larger response than the sham of 0.1. And furthermore, that this effect was replicable in other studies and also in repeat studies of their own. Um, furthermore, one could argue that um, there's a somatostatic feeling that you have when you have the current or the, the voltage pads on your head, and you could argue that that is affecting learning. But it turns out they actually studied that, and they found that there was no effect on the skin sensation. Um, they measured what was actually going on through using MRS spectroscopy, and they found that there was actually repregulation of glutamate and um, N acetyl uh, aspartate, which is um, related to uh, the glutamate. Um, so, and then they also saw um, that the, oops, the site that was actually stimulated um, under fMRI actually showed um, changes in activity 
um, an fMRI and an MEG. Um, so um, after um, measuring reaction times, the only significant changes that they actually measured was that in uh, alertness. And that's important because that's attention, and attention is really critical for learning. Um, so their effect sizes um, were relatively significant um, for working memory and um, all, the, all different types of memories, and, um, but more particularly for attention. And so they argue that perhaps um, this is actually real um, and it's not placebo. Um, and um, they, th they, they basically suggest that um, uh, there may be actually changes in the neurophysiology of neurons. Um, and here they did some computer modeling and they showed that the effect actually is not just at the superficial layers, but it actually occurs in deeper structures. And they say that um, in particular, in this particular model, the, the spinal cord is affected. They argue that that might be related to the arm that's involved in um, the task. Um, so um, other people have used um, TDCS to study language and they've shown that there's been improvements in acquisition time. Um, but one of the biggest changes that people have, been measure, have measured is that there's actually an increase in verbal fluency. Um, furthermore, um, there's been demonstration that people's ability to read improves using this um, co-agonist. And further, um, in patients who have stroke, um, they found some improvement in the motor cortex um, as demonstrated here um, in this simple experiment. I won't go into the, all the details because it's um, pretty complex. But, um, and then finally, they showed that um, TCS can help in improve mental flexibility and impulse control. Um, and um, and they did a, there's another group that looked at um, numerical competence using symbolic representations and they showed that um, that people who have the stimulation actually start thinking of symbolic representations more mathematically. Um, and they controlled for all sorts of different factors um, that um, would affect numerical processing. The other thing is that there's actually a subjective experience that people report with TCS. Um, people say that they think clearer, the room appears brighter, their mood is improved, um, and that the background noise that they might have goes away. Um, clinical uses of TDS range from pain, this is kind of like TENS units, um, to um, uh, treating depression and PTSD. But there's been a lot of different um, things that TDCS has been used for, ranging to schizophrenia, addiction, bipolar, multiple sclerosis, um, stroke, particularly aphasia, um, and then cognitive um, things. In particular, meditation. It turns out that TCS actually potentiates the meditative state. Well, that makes sense because that's a default mode network. Um, but the, the sum of the results of the studies of depression so far are been, have been mixed. And, this, and I'll talk a little bit about why. Um, so here's, a, here's some studies that looked at motor recovery and stroke patients. And um, they did a couple of different uh, ways of stimulation, um, varying the anode and the cathode. Um, and they actually... Um, overall measure, um, there's actually some plasticity occurring at, two, at up to two months. Um, and this could be really important for patients who have stroke. Um, so one of the things that we often do in psychiatry is we provide coagonists. Um, so what would be the effect of actually adding pharmacology when administering um, this neurostimulation? Well, this group here, um, Michael Nietzsche, he's one of the leaders in this field. Germany um, looked at the effects of decycloserine um, and showed that um, these particular medications, amphetamines, decycloserine, um, and SSRI such as Celexa, um, actually cause a prolongation of the duration of the effect um, of, the, of the neural plastic changes. So, and you see that this is replicated in um, those three drugs. Um, this past uh, fall, I went to Germany and I attended a, a meeting. Um, and I met, I was, it was at the psychiatric clinic uh, at the University of Munich, and this is the entry. Um, this group is, this is Dan Kieser, Daniel Kieser, and he's involved in a lot of the actual investigations on using transcranial and direct current stimulation. Um, uh, this place is famous because um, Alzheimer uh, worked there and also Emil Kreplin. And this is a picture of um, a gentleman who's very famous for S. Loretta um, Pasquale, um, DeMarkey, I think. Um, anyways, you can see here that there's been a lot of clinical trials um, investigating the use of TDCS. This ranges from the depression trial, this is Kieser's trial, 
um, which is finished. And then um, there's the trial using P TDCS with, um, with uh, psychotherapy and also with, for PTSD. And these are ongoing as of um, last January. Um, so the, 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 the trial with psychotherapy just started this month and then the trial for um, PTSD was last month. Um, here, um, a Kieser's group looked at a patient with depression and uh, they showed that the uh, Hamilton Depressing Rating Scale actually uh, decreased from 23 to 19 and the BDI from 27 to 20. These aren't really big effects, um, but they did see a very large increase in uh, verbal fluency from 52 to 90 percent. Um, the same group actually did, took that pilot data and then did a randomized control, uh, double-blind placebo uh, study. And, um, but their, their, their results from that was actually kind of equivocal. Um, so um, they uh, didn't actually see any major changes, no significant difference. Um, well, um, what's interesting, though, is that um, they, um, the, these investigators wanted to figure out what else is going on. Well, they actually went in and measured brain-derived a neurotrophic factor, and not surprisingly, this was unchanged after TDCS. Well, that might support the fact that BDNF is important for um, treating depression, and this is how, this is the actual results where there was no change at two weeks and four weeks in BDNF. Um, the next thing they did was actually investigate changes in resting state networks um, using fMRI, and what they showed is that um, there's particular networks um, that are affected. Um, in particular, um, um, there's the, um, um, they showed that um, when um, TCS is administered, so this is baseline right here, these are the different areas of the brain that are stimulated. Um, so after TDCS, so note this stimulation area right here, but notice this little line here. So there's actually increased functional connectivity, and you can see that the changes after, after TDCS. Um, and furthermore, these um, fMRI images support that, uh, those conclusions as well. And I don't want to get into all the details. just want to show you just roughly what, what they did. Um, so the other thing that they examined, they did another study examining schizophrenics. And um, in particular, they examined the effects of TCS on auditory visual hallucinations. And um, they found that um, there's actually a change in the resting state functional connectivity in this network um, at the left temporal parietal junction in patients with schizophrenia. And what they measured was there's actually a decrease in negative symptoms um, over time. And so here's the baseline. And you can see by week two, there's from 93 to 86. And so there's actually a decrease in negative symptoms in schizophrenics. Um, and uh, they also noticed that there were changes in uh, the brain, and this is, um, this is the uh, table showing that, and changes in the right inferior frontal gyrus, the left anterior insula. Um, there's changes in functional connectivity of the middle frontal, the DLPFC, um, the left angular, and the precuneus. Um, so um, now I want to just go through some of the new devices that are coming on the market. Um, this is a device that was funded by Peter Thiel, um, who you might all know help fund Facebook. Um, he's a Silicon Venture, Silicon, Silicon Valley venture capitalist. Um, Think was created by a neuroscientist and um, they, what they do is they got past the FDA requirement um, by advertising this as basically a lifestyle enhancing device. Um, and here's, a, here's the picture of it. Um, and uh, they, they argue in terms of marketing that um, this actually can augment um, or replace an espresso or a glass of wine um, by running the, the vibe mode. Um, and here, uh, there's a lady wearing it. And they, they say that um, when using the vibe mode, it actually, can, can I meditate while using calm vibes? Uh, definitely. In fact, meditation may improve your experience when running a calm vibe. Um, and uh, they also make claims that it can Im improve the quality of sleep. Um, this is a, another device, um, actually, I think I have some time. Um, oh, this is Cephaly. Oh, wait. So, first thing I like to... Sorry. So. Well, let's skip that. Um, 
So, that it is just a t okay, this is um, a video of, uh, of um, a lady that... Electronic current through a single electrode mm -hmm. that fits just above the brow. The electrode stimulates the nervous system to produce pain relief. It has three settings to stop a migraine, prevent a migraine coming on and a relaxation setting. It doesn't involve taking medicines. It doesn't involve having to go to a therapist to have treatment. Dr Len Rose says the cephaly is essentially the same electrical nerve stimulation or TENS technology that's been around for decades. But this is the first time it's been available in a compact mobile device like this. The cephaly produces a very, very low voltage, low current, which people feel in most cases, just like a tingling sensation. He's been trialling the device on some of his patients, including Lorna, and says so far the feedback's been positive. A recent study also found the cephaly to be 25% more effective than other migraine treatments. There's even some evidence to suggest it may also be used to help troubled sleepers. It's another way of looking at uh, uh, a treatment for sleep that doesn't involve taking potentially addictive drugs. Megan has also been trialling the device. She says she hasn't had a migraine since. I've been sleeping incredibly well, solidly, throughout you know the whole night, not waking up, and waking up feeling very... So that's a pretty, um, pretty big deal like if you can um, basically cure someone's or effectively cure someone's migraines. Um, and uh, they report uh, an efficacy rate of patients, about 71% of patients are satisfied with this compared to not being so satisfied with medications. Um, and obviously they're, they claim that it's more safe than medications. Um, they, have, they report minimal side effects and um, they really don't specify too many contraindications, which I'll get to here in a second. The device costs about $374. Um, these are some uh, new EEG arrays that I just wanted to show you um, that they're marketing. And this is the extent of some of the technology now. We can actually measure EEG through wireless. And this is a, a, a gentleman holding um, a, a phone and he's measuring his brain signals on his phone. Um, so what are some of the limitations of this technology? Well, first of all, it's not really widely being used, so there hasn't been a lot of studies at all. Um, basically, we're probably where we were um, with um, RTMS um, 15 years ago in terms of this, the studies for this technology. Um, so we also don't know the long-term effects of this treatment. Um, few of the re investigators are actually reporting on effect size, so there could be some bias. Um, there's been poor control. Some people argue that sham is not enough. Um, and uh, um, there really isn't a fundamental unifying hypothesis. There's actually some adverse effects that people can report. Does anyone want to actually try that? Um, so one of the things that people actually feel is some skin irritation. There's a metal metallic taste in the mouth. If you put this above the eyes, you'll actually generate phosphines. And, and a long time ago, they used to actually try to trick treat people with blindness using electricity by triggering those phosphines. Um, there's the side effect of some blurry vision. Maybe the, the settings aren't right, you can have a headache. Um, you feel this electric shock. So they say when you put this thing on, you're supposed to turn up the amplitude to the point where you start feeling just a minor amount of tingling. It's like a mosquito bite or something. If you don't use the right cathode or anode positions, you can actually worsen mood. Um, but one of the things that people don't really mention is that if you actually increase the voltage or the current so much you can actually potentially uh, burst a blood vessel in the brain. Um, um, so these TENS units, the one I'm holding in my hand, is actually shouldn't be used as a TDCS device because this can reach a voltage of 70 volts, um, which they don't really mention on the product um, uh, description, um, but that's a lot. 70 volts to your head would hurt, certainly damage, um, certainly hurt you. Um, and so uh, um, we also don't know what the long-term effects of this technology is, I mean, in terms of structural um, changes. Um, then there were, there's some data that suggests that uh, cancer cells tend to be 
uh, relatively sensitive to electrical stimulation. So if you have a person who has an underlying tumor um, and you provide this um, field gradient, um, I don't know if there's been studies, but there's, there could be possibly changes in tumor growth. Um, so I have some questions for everybody if they get out their clickers. So the first question is, how does TDCS possibly work? Um, the, uh, a, increases the amplitude of action potentials. B, increases synaptic efficiency through modulating default mode networks via synaptic efficiency, increases monoamine transmission, increases um, GABA transmission. Has everybody answered? So I guess polling is open. So I'm going to, I guess, Okay, great. Now I'm going to see what the answers are. Okay, very good. Everyone got the right answer. Yay. Okay, um, the next question, though, um, is which of the following is true? Um, A, the value of TDCS stimulation is that it makes the default mode network more easily susceptible to change or adaptation. Um, B, it's a coagonist it's, um, that modulates synaptic sensitivity and efficiency. C, um, it functions only at subthreshold levels. Um, D, it modulates subthreshold oscillations. E, um, it, when paired with meditation, enhances flow. Flow is actually a state um, where you lose track of time. It's like, that, it's like that moment when you're really productive, or it's like when Roger Federer or um, um, Michael Jordan um, state that they're in the zone. Um, so uh, does TDCS actually enhance that state? Um, and further, um, F, um, coupling TCS with psychotherapy, um, does that result in maximal clinical efficiency? Or G, all of the above. Okay, everyone's had time to answer, and we'll open up for polling. Yay! Okay, good. Um, so those were the major take-home points that I wanted to um, summarize with. Um, that all of the above is actually involved. What's key to understand here is that um, subthreshold oscillations are affected, and that involves ionic currents. So you're actually just changing the, the resting state of the, of the brain. Um, so good, good job, everyone. Um, thank you. Does anyone have any questions? do a study like that and I have one person who's maybe read 10 questions and starting to get a little drowsy and I got a, the other patient I've got a little needle that I stick it in the back of their neck just to keep them you know alert they're going to do better or, and the same thing is with the you, you know this there's a little bit of skin irritation so the person is kept alert and to me the best sham would not be I don't know what they use for a sham exactly, but it should be something that's maybe slightly irritating to, that could enhance their alertness. That's very good. Um, like a great scientist. Um, <laughs> that's actually, that's actually the, one of the major questions about these studies. And Michael Nietzsche actually gave a talk, I think, um, um, recently um, discussing how, I think it was Michael Nietzsche, it might have been someone else, but um, how that the actual stimulation sham is not an adequate control, um, and you raise a really important um, confounding factor. Um, so right now they don't know. There's, they haven't really decided what's going to be the most uh, standard and the most effective um, um, control. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I really liked your comments about the theory that setting up eddy currents is the way that this kind of thing works. That's a very interesting idea. I hadn't really heard that before. And your hypothesis about glutamine and dopamine, I think one of the other things you might want to think about integrating in that idea is given the fact that you have a stimulation mode on the left and an innovation mode on the right, you've got dopamine much more active on the left, norepinephrine much more active on the right, and my guess is 
those systems are all integrated together in terms of working through stimulation and inhibitory modes. Might be an interesting thing to add. Yeah, so um, I gave, like in my last talk, I basically showed that I think, um, so there's this um, master switch, um, it's, the, it's DARP32, um, mm -hmm. dopamine phosphoregulated protein 32 or phosphoprotein. Um, so that's where all your monamines come in, like the norepinephrine, serotonin, um, and also GABA. So, um, so yeah, that's where I was trying to integrate that idea with that little symbol there. Um, but yeah, um, I don't know actually about eddy currents with TDCS. I was actually referring to TMS, but that mm -hmm. could actually occur. I don't know. That's a good question. But I mean, it does actually suggest the basic idea that subthreshold. Um, ionic changes are occurring, um, and so yeah, there, it's basically like an eddy effect, perhaps. Just one other quick observation I wanted to add was the fact that, uh, you know, in your allusion to NMDA receptors and the fact that there are two different types, ligand and voltage gated, there's a lot of theory that the reason that human brain evolution has been so sophisticated compared to our near peers is that the idea that you can actually load one end of the NMDA receptor system and then modulate that fully loaded system with a second receptor differential allows brain capacities that wouldn't otherwise work in people in in other animals without that kind of uh, capacity and that's been thought to be a major evolutionary feature of humans yeah Very interesting I, idea. I agree I think that's something that's not talked about much but it's very unique in our brains how the NMDA receptor works it actually has three or three major inputs that's necessary for activating it. So, yep. So, the um, question I have is, do you think that sleep deprivation might enhance how TC, TDCS works, much as, you know, when we do sleep deprivation and we're looking for, like, um, seizure enhance, to detect seizures when we're doing EEGs and things, do you think, because we know the sleep deprivation is an acute antidepressant effect. So do you think that this might in some way prime the system so that when you actually implement this, you might actually get an augmented response. Yeah, absolutely, it does. Um, sleep deprivation is um, it, like puts people in the, the one of the default mode networks. So um, it is um, for sure um, no, said, or they, I guess they've found evidence for um, that it potentiates the effects of TDCS. I would actually explain it the other way that TDCS potentiates um, that that mode or that network, I guess. Um, yeah. Dr. You uh, showed a slide on MRS and glutamate, and glutamate using MRS can be pretty difficult to differentiate from glutamine, and sometimes a combined GLX peak is used. So I did, didn't know if that had been uh, ferreted out in that study. And you also showed NAA effects, which is a marker of neuronal cell death, but isn't necessarily directly related to uh, glutamate-induced excitotoxicity is the only way that uh, uh, neuronal cell death might occur. So I wondered if you would comment on that as well. Well, that speaks a lot to the unknown. I think um, we, we don't really know um, what the effects of this technology is on, um, on cells. Um, for instance, is it actually causing excitotoxic cell death? Um, so if that's what they're measuring, they... Um, I didn't look at that study in that level of detail, but um, that could be a confounding factor for sure um, that they're measuring. But I guess um, in terms of the, the science, um, what's really nice is that we, we, you can make the claim that um, the electricity is affecting that pathway through the NMDA receptors. Whether or not it's safe, that's a different story. I don't think we know yet for sure. But the, we are, they are measuring some effects and. I think there needs to be more and more um, repeat studies. Some investigators actually argue that, um, that placebo controls aren't necessary, like they're, they're already being able to control for them for their self or something. I don't quite understand that, but, um, but yeah, so the, the people are still working this out. No other questions? I thank, every, or thank you. Thank you very much for coming. Thanks.